Well, hello, everyone. Uh, I'm Julian Rappaport, Emeritus Professor of Psychology at the University of Illinois in Champaign-Urbana. The Seymour B. Saracen Award was created in 1993 to recognize individuals, quote, working in the conceptually demanding, creative, and groundbreaking tradition of Seymour B. Saracen. Joseph P. Gorn, the 2021 award winner, is a brilliant example of the Saracen tradition in community psychology. Today, I think of these two men as bookends for our field. Saracen began his career at Yale in the post-World War II era. He took on the most difficult social issues of his day by using astute observation and an understanding of history and culture to engage the social institutions and community settings that he encountered. He brought this work into the earliest emergence of our field with his powerful writing that crossed the disciplines of psychology, education, and anthropology by using their broadest methods without being limited by their most narrow methodological traditions. Joseph P. Gorn addresses the social issues of our day with work that brings history, anthropology, and cultural psychology into clinical counseling and community psychology. Like Saracen, he pushes the boundaries of our field. He forces us to take a critical look at our history, our practices, and our assumptions, while also pushing us toward new ways to think and do our work. Ultimately, Joe's work is an example for all of us and how to actually respect, appreciate, and take seriously the people we care about. He is, I am proud to say, a graduate of the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign program in clinical community psychology, and has been a professor at the University of Chicago and at the University of Michigan in clinical psychology and Native American studies. Professor Gorn is currently Professor of Anthropology at Harvard, Professor of Global Health and Social Medicine in the Medical School, and Faculty Director of Harvard's Native American program. He is President of the Society of Indian Psychology. Joe is also uh, already recipient of many prestigious awards, including a Guggenheim Fellowship, and a fellowship at Stanford Center for Advanced Study in the Behavioral Sciences. This summer, APA will honor him with its 2021 award for distinguished professional contributions to applied research. Today's talk, Reimagining Mental Health Services for American Indian Communities, Centering Indigenous Perspectives, is based on many years of collaboration with Native people and communities. It's my pleasure to give you Joseph Gorn. Well, thank you, Julian. Um, <clears throat> I so appreciate that introduction. And uh, when I was notified uh, with the thrilling news of uh, receiving this award, I was invited to uh, nominate who would introduce me. And of course, uh, Professor Rappaport was my first choice, having been my doctoral student mentor <laughs> and a, a, a important advisor um, ever since. So thank you, Julian, for those kind words. Um, you yourself, of course, were a winner of this award some years ago now, and it's a pleasure to um, walk in your footsteps in this respect as well. Thank you to the awards committee for uh, considering me and, and, and selecting me for this really cherished honor. Um, let me just say that I'm talking today from Cambridge, Massachusetts. Uh, Cambridge sits in the traditional ter territory of the Massachusetts tribe at Ponkapog. And we um, remember <clears throat> our historical connections to those people um, who live today and endure <clears throat> in important ways. I wanna share my screen so I can um, begin talking today a bit as I trace my journey um, in community psychology with you. Um, so you get a sense for how I thought about um, some of this work. First, I wanted to just um, say a word about Seymour B. Saracen as well, whom I never had a chance to meet um, but I, um, in preparation for this, had a chance to review the obituary um, for Professor Saracen that appeared in the New York Times. 
Now, Julian, of course, has already given you some aspects of his legacy. Here are just a few things from this obituary that stood out to me as um, you know, inspiring the kind of work that I do, and you'll see it tracing through what I'm going to talk about today. Um, according to this obituary, he was quite disenchanted with clinical psychology. Um, you know, I'm uh, certainly familiar with that feeling. Um, he disputed that individual problems should be treated individually. Um, this, of course, is a long-standing tenet of community psychology. He abandoned the lab um, to venture into community settings to do his uh, work and to make his contributions, something that um, certainly um, I do as well. And just looking at some of the titles of some of his major books, I mean, he was a prolific uh, writer and published a, a ton of amazing influential stuff, but, you know, psychology and community settings, uh, the creation of settings and the future of societies and the psychological sense of community are just capturing some of the important ideas that Professor Saracen contributed to our um, uh, society and the work that we do together. Who am I? <clears throat> well, um, first, I should say that I'm an enrolled member of the Aani Grovant Tribal Nation of Montana. We're at the Fort Belknap Indian Reservation. Um, I'm also an academic psychologist um, in which I um, mix and blend uh, different kinds of traditions within psychology and also across other social sciences. I'm clinically trained, community engaged, and culturally attuned in all the work that I do. And my research interests in particular lie at this intersection of culture, coloniality, and mental health. Um, I'm specifically interested in indigenous psychologies and what that might imply for cross-cultural interventions. I really have four goals in the time that we have today for this presentation. I want to define for you what I refer to as a post-colonial predicament that vexes mental health services for American Indian communities. I'll consider various community-based approaches that harness, quote, culture as treatment, unquote, for resolving this post-colonial predicament. I want to assess the strengths and limitations of these diverse approaches relative to issues of co community commensurability. And of course, in doing so, I'll grapple with challenges facing these kinds of projects in the era of professional accountability and evidence-based practice in mental health. Let me start today then with reviewing for you what I call the post-colonial predicament. As you're probably well aware, we exhibit and experience and contend with mental health inequities in many of our indigenous and native communities. That is to say, we have pronounced mental health problems. And importantly, the mental health services that are on offer in our communities to address these problems are deeply underfunded. And this might lead us to conclude rather intuitively that the solution is simple. Let's resource those properly and then expand mental health services for greater access and availability, and that should solve our problem of these inequities, right? Well, in fact, in early in my career, I undertook work on my own home reservation at Fort Belknap to explore an open-ended, discovery-oriented fashion, uh, the way some people in an extended family I worked with thought about mental health problems on the reservation, particularly problem drinking and clinical depression. Um, and I learned from this consultation in particular that ex simply expanding mental health services might not be the only uh, or important solution. Um, specifically, I focused on work I did with a grassroots uh, traditionalist named Traveling Funder in our work together, um, who taught me a lot about uh, how to think about mental health from the perspective of community members. In fact, what he had to say about problem drinking and depression in our own community uh, comprises what I refer to and what other medical anthropologists refer to as an explanatory model, a conceptual approach to framing, understanding issues like etiology, a course, treatment, and remedy for uh, what are often construed as mental health problems. Basically, in uh, his consideration of problem drinking and depression in our community, he really charted four historical epics or eras in his explanation for how we've come to contend with these and what needs to happen. The first era he described concerned pre-colonial existence, and he described it in a way that was akin to paradise. Essentially, he said that during this time, indigenous peoples ex experienced perfect harmony and balance, owing, he said, to strict observation of custom. But of course, that era didn't last. Uh, there was the second era of colonial contact in which Europeans arrived and conquest followed, and he specifically pinpointed the annihilation of indigenous custom as a key aspect of this conquest. This led, he said, to a third era of post-colonial effects, effects which could be described as loss. 
Specifically, he identified a form of you know, psychosocial anime, which means normlessness or loss of identity, purpose, who you're supposed to be, what you belong, what you're supposed to do, and so on, that leads to pathology. And he explicitly designated the so-called white man system as pathogenic with respect to these problems. Fortunately, he didn't stop there. He said there was a fourth era, an era that arose in the red power movement of the 1970s, an era of post-colonial remedy grounded in revitalization. Specifically, he talked about returning to indigenous, especially sacred custom during this time period as a way to remedy these problems. And so you see this is a historical account that is cyclical, starts with strict observation of custom, goes through conquest and loss, and then a return to custom. He identified a really clear pathological process in describing these problems. This, I don't have time to show you his words, but I could trace this out literally exactly as I've reproduced it here, that cultural repression featured as, as an expression of colonial, colonialism that led of the colonization that led to anime, then to substance abuse, depression, worthlessness, and suicide. Importantly, he offered very little elaboration of personal distress he did not speak in terms that mental health professionals would typically recognize. He didn't talk about biology like brain chemistry or genetics. He didn't talk about psychology all that much, in fact. Instead, he emphasized history, culture, and spirituality in his explanation for these problems in our community. Moreover, as I mentioned, he unpacked the pathogenic aspects of the white man system. In doing so, he really underscored colonization as the cause of native distress. He emphasized systemic factors over intrapersonal factors, those having to do inside or within a person, and shared community vulnerabilities, that the entire community went through this, not this person or that person so much. And I'll just mention the term historical trauma, which many of you may be familiar with now, uh, which is really the kind of explanation that Traveling Thunder offered. But the only difference really is he didn't have much of a psychology to his explanation, and so he didn't use the word trauma and that's one distinction in terms of the um, concept that proliferates now. Well, like you, you, uh, you might wonder, I wondered how you know, relevant then psychosocial interventions, therapy, helping services might be in response to this explanatory um, uh, approach that a traveling funder shared with me. So I asked them, you know, under what conditions would you take a, a loved one in crisis down to the Indian Health Service Behavioral Health Clinic and get some help for them from a therapist? Well, he grew quiet in response to that. And after sober consideration for maybe 10 or 15 seconds, he said the following. I guess it's like a war, but they're not using bullets anymore. They want to wipe us out and therefore the Indian problem will be gone forever. But they're using a more shrewder way than the old style of bullets. If you look at the big picture, you look at your past, your history, where you come from, and you look at your future where the white man's leading you, I guess you could make a choice. Where do I want to end up? And I guess a lot of people want to end up looking good to the white man. Then it'd be a good thing to do. Go to the white psychiatrist in the, in the Indian Health Service and say, well, go ahead and rid me of my history, my past, and brainwash me forever so I can be like a white man. I guess that'd be a choice each individual will have to make. And so we see in this uh, quote here, Traveling Thunder's recognition that mental health treatment is a cross-cultural encounter for some Indian people, people like him who are oriented in a traditional way. Um, not only that, that mental health services are ideological. That is, they contain the potential for implicit Western cultural proselytization. And I use that term proselytization to refer to missionary-like work. Um, sometimes when I'm talking with other Indian psychologists, who are therapists and psychologists and mental health folks, I'll say maybe we're trained as missionaries for a new millennium. In essence, then, this set up for all of my work what I've referred to as this post-colonial predicament. You'll see here I put the post in parentheses because it's not entirely clear that we're post-colonial in Native North America. But in reference to this predicament, I'm, I'm describing the fact that on one hand, we have rather urgent community needs. Many of us live uh, and grow, uh, develop in impoverished high-risk settings. And there are documented disparities in mental health status in these settings as a result. On the other hand, the services that are on offer to remedy these issues are um, often incongruent for different people in these settings. It refers back to what traveling had to say about brainwashing me forever so I can be like a white man. And uh, this incongruence has been attested to by community anecdote and by research evidence that has systematically explored uh, treatment preferences in Indian communities. So let me now shift to a subsequent project I undertook um, in an effort to explore 
therapeutic integration in native controlled treatment. So if we take this post-colonial predicament seriously, it enables us to recognize that all clinical intervention is inherently cultural prescription and that all clinical intervention therefore potentially uh, pr presents this hazard for American Indian communities at least of a kind of neo-colonial cultural proselytization. So I wanna consider seriously the things I hear everywhere I go in Indian country from people who are engaged in mental health work or know mental health or advocate for better mental health treatment. They say, we don't need the latest evidence-based practice. Our culture is our treatment. And when they say this, here's what I think they mean, that we're interested in therapeutic alternatives to evidence-based practice and the technologies of uh, psychological scientists and mental health experts, um, instead to focus on often reclaimed traditional practices. Uh, they mean that uh, our, our culture is grounded in a holistic rationale that's uh, based on spirituality and religious experience. And that harnessing these approaches are addressed to personal distress in a way that will matter for an individual. But it's not only distress, it's also to cultural identity, which of course is not just individual, but shared. And also community renewal and self-determination as well. So there's a much more, if you will, holistic or agglomerative feature that this kind of alternative um, harnesses. So um, I'm going to move through this part in somewhat cursory fashion for time purposes. But I did a work at a Canadian First Nation healing lodge back in the early 2000s. Uh, this was a substance abuse treatment center uh, that was you know, controlled by a tribal nation in Canada. Um, and I focused in particular with staff and clients in the outpatient substance abuse treatment, treatment program. And part of what interested me about their work is they were overtly committed to integrating what they called Western and what they called Aboriginal therapeutic practices. So therapeutic integration is what they were doing. So I wanted to know what does therapeutic practice look like in this setting in descriptive terms? What does healing mean in this therapeutic context in terms of elucidation? And what are the prospects and pitfalls of therapeutic integration in this kind of uh, world, the implications? And it was sort of a brief ethnography with interviews and so on. So just in terms of what does therapeutic practice look like, there were these two categories of approaches as I described, Western approaches. When they talked about Western approaches in this treatment center, what they really first and foremost meant was the 12 steps and traditions of Alcoholics Anonymous. Um, it's a substance abuse treatment center, of course, but also they talked about the spiritual components of AA as why it was the most important thing to build on. They also talked a lot about other complementary and alternative treatments um, that they labeled Western, even though those sometimes come from other parts of the world before being uh, adopted and adapted in you know, a modern US context. Um, you know, they talked about Reiki, which is, you know, kind of Japanese uh, massage therapy. They talked about the seven sacred chakras. So they were interested in a lot of things. Really, what, what uh, was important to them was an appeal of this often um, nebulous, but all encompassing spirituality. If it was a spiritual treatment, different staff were usually interested. They had a complete absence of really evidence-based treatments for some, and they weren't interested in those at all from what I could tell. Beyond Western approaches, they also talked about Aboriginal approaches. These were you know, traditional ceremonial approaches like talking circles, the sweat lodge, pipe ceremonies, and so on. These were actually institutionalized in the treatment program. Every Thursday afternoon, for example, there was a sweat lodge ceremony for all clients who were interested. And like it often happens in Indian communities, there were contestations surrounding cultural authenticity around some of these things, but it was clearly a top priority for them to have and to integrate these kinds of approaches. Now you might wonder, how do you take this wide disparate array of approaches and do anything coherent uh, for treatment with it? Well, the way they did this was adopting a med the medicine wheel model um, to talk about and help clients understand uh, their own treatment. The medicine wheel, as you see portrayed here on the right, um, is a circle bisected into four quadrants. Those four quadrants um, have traditionally been associated with the four cardinal directions. So it, it, images directional space, but also if you trace the circumference by entering in you know, from the east here and moving clockwise around to the east again, it images cyclical time, you know, like the seasons of the year, for example, are often associated with each of these quadrants. It basically in conceptual terms is reflecting this balance of four constituent parts. Um, and applied to human psychology, it really allows for a topography of the self. 
you've got spirit, mind, body, and emotion, or sometimes sociality. The fourth one can differ a little bit depending on what community you're in. But the idea is it's a topography of the self and a rendering of the human lifespan in which you move through four stages of development, enter at the East as an infant who's utterly dependent on relatives. You move around through adolescence, adulthood, and elderhood to which you become dependent again on relatives until you pass. So the, uh, the, the medicine wheel really allowed clients to think about balance and harmony between the four parts of the self and the healing work that they were doing. And they might take advantage of any of those different practices that were available. And so the meaning of healing was something I had to try to intuit from all they were saying and to thematically analyze from things they had said. No one person said, here's the meaning of healing. Uh, they did talk about things explicitly though, like you know, spiritual transformations or existential transformations that link imperfect selves to a higher sense of purpose. And given it's a you know, native community that's gone through colonization, this kind of post-colonial reclamation of indigenous cultural identity featured very prominently. These are the kind of things they said you know, overtly when I asked what healing meant. But there was a, also an implicit sense of the meaning of healing that came through the things they talked about and the way they explained and described their work with clients. Basically, um, they observed that you know, uh, clients that they see are carrying emotional burdens, unexpressed pain from the past that has undermined their present day functioning, but that these burdens can begin to be dealt with through cathartic expression that you can release this unexpressed pain through verbal expression of past ordeals that can help to begin to restore one to wellness. And of course, they also then uh, were projecting uh, the idea that patients or clients engaged in treatment should take the self on as a project, that you start to think of the self as requiring lifelong practices of self-examination, self-awareness, working on oneself uh, in order to maintain wellness. And this became really what was described as a healing journey. Put all this together, you've got a summary meaning of healing that I learned from therapists and clients in this setting. And I'll just give you, you know, five seconds to read that. Clearly, though, um, what was important beyond just these sorts of aspects was the buttressing of Aboriginal identity. I believe that speaks back to the kind of anime issue that Traveling Thunder identified and that features in historical trauma explanations for Indigenous suffering. It also bridges the individual and the community, again, in the way Traveling Thunder was doing. In terms of the remedy, then, that this might afford or provide for Indigenous uh, people contending with something like substance abuse, what was sort of clear, particularly on the more implicit meanings of healing, uh, was the proliferation of what has been described as therapy culture. Um, you know, Frank Ferretti is a sociologist who wrote all about this. You know, the idea it's not really therapy, trained clinicians and so on. It's more like what happens in the self-help movement, what happens through the bookstores and the talk shows and that sort of thing. That's kind of, you know, you can recognize the kind of pop psychoanalysis, you know, unexpressed pain, but if you can give voice to it, you can cathart it and that will inaugurate, you know, a, a journey of wellness. Um, staff had great enthusiasm for this, in part because it had worked for them and they were eager to share it with other community members um, who were going through a tough time as well. Um, but in terms of pursuit of cultural commensurability, there seemed to be a little bit of a dilemma here. Because one thing I learned in talking with the clients very many of them expressed deep discomfort with the therapeutic mandate to talk, to verbally express past pain, to talk about you know, childhood adversity and family dynamics and so on. Um, and I think that had to do with communicative norms that governed in this community and govern lots of Native communities today in which intimate talk is really restrained into very close uh, uh, loved ones or friends, relatives. Um, but in public, you don't necessarily say a lot about personal things. The face-to-face -face community, you live with people your entire life together, family, uh, reputations are how the world is structured. So there was a great deal of client reticence in this respect that butted into this invitation to engage in therapeutic expressivity. And so I think that for, that was one reason why a lot of the clients didn't really stick it out and didn't necessarily complete the program. And so I think what this implies is our need to reconfigure our understanding of the kind of core periphery or deep surface attributes of integrative therapeutic approaches. 
in this case, the Aboriginal was a little more peripheral and the core was this pop psychoanalysis stuff. And maybe a reversal of that might help in future efforts of this sort. Let me tell now about an indigenous alternative back to culture as treatment. And I think what we wanna consider here is the importance of centering indigenous therapies, which might require us to go beyond the usual approach. The usual approach, as I describe it, is to start with mainstream, maybe evidence-based psychosocial interventions, and then adapt these for use in diverse community-based mental health services. But I think that what this invites us to do is to consider an inverted approach in which we start with indigenous therapeutic traditions and then figure out secondarily how to cultivate those for use as interventions in community-based mental health services. Now, there's a whole reason behind this that's worth uh, spelling out briefly. First, the context is, again, like this historical trauma or traveling funders explanatory model, the kind of thing I already set out for you. And it is useful to focus on substance abuse problems. That is a place where you often see this kind of work happening. Um, substance abuse, you know, of course, is a mental disorder in the DSM, but perhaps in this context is best construed as a post-colonial pathology. The rationale for culture as treatment really is based on the fact that everywhere you go in Indian country, people attribute recovery from substance abuse to a return to traditional cultural practices. And there's a scientific literature as a result for people when, and when researchers have studied this stuff that links traditional cultural practices to recovery. Not only that, I think it's evident from our own personal experience with family and loved ones and other people we know that, uh, that you know, dramatic spiritual or existential reorientation is really possible in ways that transform an individual's purpose, motivation, spirituality, and social networks. I think of becoming a born again Christian, for example, when someone's life is completely turned around, um, that's the sort of thing that might uh, be being referenced here. I began a, a partnership with the Crystal Creek Lodge in Browning, Montana, with, through an initial dialogue in the spring of 2008 with some of its staff members. Crystal Creek Lodge is the, uh, the Blackfeet Nation's accredited substance abuse treatment program that has a residential treatment program and an outpatient program. Um, and I worked with the staff to sort of say, look, here you have, um, you know, a kind of Minnesota model, 12 steps based approach to working with your clients. Um, you know, it's based on the first five steps in particular. It's all group sessions. Yes, there's a cultural counselor and a cultural group, but mostly it's 12 steps. What about this inverted approach? How interested would you be in trying to start with Blackfeet therapeutic tradition and imagining something that uh, started from there? And how uh, open would you be to wanting to get some outcome evidence associated with this so that we could persuade people who are skeptical that it might be of use? Well, they were very excited about it. And so we began an extended deliberation in 2009 to formulate a Blackfeet treatment model that would be an alternative to what they were doing already. Um, they invited us as a group to consult with Blackfeet bundle keepers. These are ritual sacred uh, people, custodians of, of spiritual traditions, and enlisted what is known as the Crazy Dog Society in the Blackfeet Nation, a group of neo-traditionalists who gather for ceremonial purposes uh, to uh, guide what this might look like. The result was a pretty radically alternative treatment model, in quotes. It was basically a summer cultural immersion camp facilitated by members of this crazy dog society, not by accredited um, licensed or uh, substance abuse treatment counselors, but by members of this crazy dog society with an overt goal of socializing addiction clients into quote, the old Blackfeet religion is how they referred to it, to distinguish it in some ways from pan Indian approaches. And the underlying rationale was that healing and recovery from addiction or from anything really come from spiritual practices that actively circulate life. I put life in quotes because there's not an English word to capture, you know, indigenous conceptions of life as uh, that which drives out death and despair and poverty and sickness and so on. But the ideas, uh, there are really just idea, uh, notions behind, behind and undergirding this. We piloted this in 2012, the Blackfeet Culture Camp, as they came up with, just as a proof of concept. It was sponsored by the Lodge, staffed by Crazy Dog Society members. And initially, when you do stuff in Indian country, there are very few people who are willing to be, you know, the first ones to try it. So we had four um, men who were willing to do it for uh, the first initial offering, which was just two weeks. Briefly, camp activities as uh, organized and administered by the Crazy Dog Society include traditional skills, cultural practices, and ritual participation. For example, just on day one, the first thing was to go out and set up a camp that was teepees. 
you know, and, and so learning how to set up a TP is a complicated task. You've never done it before, particularly a double TP that would serve as the council uh, meeting. But all these other things are going on too. Cultural practices like storytelling and tracing your family ancestry. Ritual participation was really important. You know, that night, uh, once the teepees were set up, we had a pipe ceremony. Day number two was going out into the bush and building a sweat lodge and having a sweat lodge ceremony. The religious spiritual components were central. The camp ethos <clears throat> was quite different than, you know, the usual addiction treatment uh, that this, these clients had been experiencing before coming out to this. First, it was very leisurely paced. Um, you know, it was got up, people woke up in the morning and then got going, and it might go till after dark in the night during the summertime, but that was okay. Loosely scripted, crazy dogs had clear ideas about what should happen and, and some idea about an order, but if something arose and you needed to adjust, fine, they would do something else. Importantly, it was really sensitively guided. <clears throat> the leaders who were in charge of this were people who were really um, empathic and able uh, to meet clients where they were at and not, um, you know, like uh, rigidly religious figures that we sometimes see in our indigenous communities around these traditions. Um, and so in that sense, they were more open and welcoming to clients. The whole thing was monitored by, you know, addiction treatment staff, of course, these are their clients and they have obligations and responsibilities for them. And of course it was community engaged. You know, when we did some of these activities, there would be 20 people going out to a sacred site or to pick sacred plants. And it was, uh, you know, a lot of crazy dogs and so on, but people didn't even know who the clients were. And it honestly, it didn't matter that much because the activity wasn't, they said, really for clients, it was for anyone who cared about being Blackfeet and returning in the, to these traditions. In terms of the enduring impressions, this was quite memorable and inspiring. It would be really difficult to overstate the sacred and the socio-political significance of this kind of effort. It was completely unrecognizable as a form of psychosocial treatment. There were no like, you know, analyze yourself or analyze your behaviors or talk about your feelings or anything that people would typically have been urged to do in usual treatment. It centered traditional spirituality and religious experience. It promoted a genuine sense of community and belonging, uh, which is in part really important for folks who've been uh, through their own substance use alienated from and, and alienated themselves from others in their communities. And it was really valued by the clients. You know, I did post-camp interviews, of course, to ask what it was like, what they would improve, what didn't work, what did work. And, you know, there were some things that they thought could be done differently or better, but they were very enthusiastic. Now, um, my involvement ended that summer, but they were so interested in this work that they kept it going additional summers with their own resources. Um, and were able to pull, you know, uh, adapt it even more, pull more people in. I mean, they basically made it their own in the wake of this initial effort. There are clear, crucial questions that arise for this kind of research, you know, empirical questions. Can processes um, linking this be harnessed as treatment? Um, is cultural immersion enough to remedy substance abuse? You know, this would require really long-term follow-up that we weren't in a position to do. Now, logistical questions, can scientific evaluation overcome like small sample sizes, constraints on random assignment, the usual things that you want to control for uh, efficacy evaluation? Um, and can development of this sort of stuff even get research funding? I mean, I did apply for research funding for it and didn't get it. Um, I had enough funding for my university. They put in funding that we could do this. And as I said, they carried it on themselves. But beyond the pilot effort, as I say, they carried it on. And it does raise the question, I think, for us as community psychologists, what if there are irreducible trade-offs between the development of community-driven post-colonial interventions on the one hand, and the design of portable, replicable, and scientifically valuable interventions? What if making it um, truly local mitigates against being able to evaluate it in the most rigorous fashion that uh, psychologists are familiar with? Let me not turn now to some next steps. In terms of that issue of portable, replicable, valuable, I did want to uh, take uh, another project on that would uh, afford potential uh, for thinking about those things um, beyond um, the Blackfeet Culture Camp. And so I began this research partnership with the Regional Urban American Indian Health Clinic in Detroit. And basically in that partnership, uh, I sat down with the executive director and said, hey, what would you like to work on? There's this little grant at the university we could put in together for it. And within 50 minutes, we came upon their interest in, in integrating traditional healing practices into clinic programming. 
they basically had a, a needs assessment they had done with 300 members of the urban Detroit Indian community. 90% of them said they wanted access to traditional healing. You know, but the question is, so how do you do that? I mean, health clinics have all kinds of ways that they do things and traditional healing has all kinds of ways that it's done and they aren't really necessarily simpatico. So it was a, you know, this was a multi-year project even to sort out this stuff. So we had a whole phase of consultation, you know, staff, providers, traditional healers. What would this look like in your view? And then there was a program development stage around, okay, here's what we've learned. And essentially when we've done with our consultation, we had good principles that we identified, but no one person said, here's the way to do this. It wasn't <clears throat> entirely clear how to do it. So, um, <clears throat> excuse me. Our response to that was to um, list a few options for our partners there and say, look, we could imagine doing this, we could imagine doing that. I think actually six different options. And they settled on one immediately. The one that would really try to socialize and introduce and orient urban Indian community members to traditional spirituality um, for those who had never had access to it. So almost, I thought of it um, as almost like Catholic confirmation you know, like a sequence of instruction and participation that would orient you how to do this. And we didn't want to take anything for granted. So, you know, we wanted to start very basically. What is prayer? How do you say a prayer? Who are you praying to? What is the purpose of prayer? You know, very, very, we didn't want to assume anything because sometimes in Indian country people don't participate in these kinds of things because they feel like they don't know enough and they could feel embarrassed about trying to get involved. So um, we did the program development phase um, and, and moved on actually to pilot implementation. And that's what I'll um, bring us up to through this final section here. So we developed the Urban American Indian Traditional Spirituality Program. Who was it for? Well, any interested adult members of the metropolitan Detroit urban Indian community who had not, no prior knowledge or experience with these things. Because if you already had some, you, know, you don't need as basic as we were aiming for. What was it? Well, it was structured orientation to indigenous spiritual practices. Where was it? At the Urban Indian Health Clinic. When? Well, one three-hour session per week for 12 weeks. And we piloted this in the spring or winter of 2016, so that's when it started. Why did we do this? Well, the purpose was to inaugurate spiritual, develop, uh, spiritual devotional life for Native participants with the idea that wellness would follow from that. And how did we do it? Well, it was through socialized participation in the sweat lodge ritual. And the sweat lodge ritual is kind of uh, very useful here because it is itself a, an agglomeration of a lot of different compliments that can be done on their own. It often includes smudging, it includes singing, it includes drumming, pipe ceremony, um, and so on that can be done in a standalone basis. So when you can learn the pieces and then they're kind of all put together in the sweat lodge and you can practice all of them in this interesting way. The program we developed had 12 sessions, as I mentioned, there was program orientation, four sessions of teachings, an actual sweat lodge ceremony led, led by a sweat lodge leader, four more sessions of teachings that really just was kind of repetitive and expansive on what had already been uh, offered, then the sweat lodge ceremony again, and then a community gathering to acknowledge what people came to refer to as graduation from this program. The components are, were these here, which I'll give you a chance to look at. Let's take five seconds to scan those. You'll notice I put drug and alcohol abuse in red. And the reason I put that in red is because that was the only component that looked at all like conventional health messaging kind of stuff. And the reason we chose to message this was because, you know, drug and alcohol use are actually incompatible with ceremonial practice and participation participation. And so it made sense in talking about that to just give a little nudge around if you think you may have trouble, you can, can you know, see someone here, you know, in, in the clinic itself. Um, and so because one of the goals was connecting people to health services in general. So but that was really the only thing that looked at all like um, health care messaging in general. We were targeting wellness outcomes. The idea was that this would help people. And so whether it's enhanced cultural identity and spirituality, ceremonial knowledge, cultural involvement, or increased community mindedness, coping skills, social support, help seeking attitudes, greater life satisfaction, reduced stress, distress symptoms and improved emotional regulation. We you know, pulled together measures of all of these things and tried them out with people to see how they would work. Um, so it was a pilot implementation. Again, um, we did interviews at the end of it, and we've got a manuscript coming out that summarizes all about um, what people had to say about the program. In general, they were very, very positive, though. 
Um, and so really the future directions for something like this are um, interesting with respect to the issue of replicability, because one of the ideas of, of um, putting together this curriculum is it is a curriculum. It's written down in modular fashion with activities all structured out and the resources you would need and the people you need to run it. And so this really could be expanded to especially other urban clinics in, in the Midwest. You know, whether it's Chicago, Milwaukee, St. Paul, you know, or, or Minneapolis, these are places that uh, share a lot of the same traditions because the, it was heavily Anishinaabe focused, uh, also some Haudenosaunee, um, but um, there was a way really based on this to um, draw in others in the future. And so there could be um, actual, you know, uh, evaluation done if you do a multi-site kind of work that we're um, still talking about in some respect. Okay, well, I wanna leave time for us to have a discussion and exchange today. So let me just go over a few take home points and then we'll wrap it up. First, community mental health services for native people are vexed by this post-colonial predicament. On the one hand, there's real mental health inequities. On the other hand, the services on offer can be incongruent for a swath of the population. Professional and indigenous therapeutic traditions diverge in really substantial cultural ways. You're seeing that in when we work in partnership with ways that people develop their own therapeutic work, it doesn't look like you know, mainstream mental health approaches. There is broad interest in reformulating services toward greater cultural commensurability. In fact, a compelling point of departure is this indigenous claim that I've heard everywhere I go that our culture is our treatment. This return to tradition is what will benefit our people and overcome uh, these post-colonial pathologies like addiction and trauma and suicide. Culture as treatment projects can depart quite substantially from recognizable forms of psychosocial intervention in the mental health uh, work. Um, but scientific evaluation of culture as treatment projects remains a worthy, uh, albeit fraught, endeavor. And I've written about all of this stuff in different places, and I try to keep this stuff available for people who want it. So here's my website. Um, but by the way, my, my name is Joseph Gaughan. Gaughan is our surname um, at Fort Belknap. And it was my great grandfather, Fred Gaughan, who got the name Gaughan because he went to industrial school at Fort Belknap to assimilate Indian kids into the white world. And uh, the practice then was to take a father's last name as a surname and then give you a Christian first name. And so his name was Many Plumes or Plenty Coup, um, but he uh, basically got his father's returns to war, um, just became gone to war or gone. Um, and he was given Fred as his first name. So gone is our family name and gone to war is where it comes from, which is why this is my name. I wanna thank you so much for, again, um, you know, um, honoring uh, this important work uh, with my partners and all the people I'm trying to reach through um, improving um, the lives of Native people. Um, and I'm really eager to hear from you and uh, your reactions and responses, questions and comments. So now I'll stop sharing and then we can go ahead and... So I think this will work best probably if you just unmute yourself and go ahead and or maybe raise a hand, I, I, unless maybe someone can help field. <laughs> it's a little hard to do in Zoom where you can't even see everyone's picture at once, right? If you have a question, if you can please um, raise your hand. Um, you can raise your hand um, by using the reactions icon uh, closer to the right. Uh, Shana? Shania, thank you. Um, I think it was more of a comment and a partial question. Um, thank you, Dr. Gan. I think this was pretty powerful because um, as a clinical therapist, and I think about so many of the quote unquote minority students I work with and how unnatural the European model of therapy is and how we try to really um, push, not push it, but we try to say, this is how, this is how you're supposed to heal, right? This is how it's supposed to be. And a lot of times, there, there's a lot of rejection of it and they don't return for services and so on. And so um, this was pretty powerful to learn and to, uh, would you, where would you recommend, even as a clinician myself, starting to learn more? Would it just be your website? What are some resources and references you could, you could connect me with? 
Yeah, you know, there's really, of course, as you know, a vast literature and what has been called cultural competence and what has come lately, you know, cultural humility. There's different kind of varieties of, of the concept of trying to reach um, in, you know, through therapy clients in a more um, appropriate way. And, you know, um, because uh, there's such a, a vast array, it kind of depends on where you want to um, first um, reach to make, uh, to alter how you interact with trainees or, or with clients. And I think the work that I'm talking about is like a um, recognizing that it's not just that clinicians and therapists and providers have to be, you know, culturally competent or culturally humble. It's recognizing that the actual activities that we're trained to do, the techniques, the technologies, the approaches come with laden with assumptions and orientations that can be culturally foreign to some people we work with. Um, and then the question is, well, just because it's culturally foreign doesn't necessarily mean it's bad. I mean, some people are open to and desiring to be socialized into those uh, cultural practices in ways that they might find beneficial. But there are others, Traveling Thunder and other people like Traveling Thunder, who see those things as ideologically contaminated in a way that they're not interested in. So the question is, what can we do when people are arriving with that set of uh, assumptions? And, um, you know, you can see that the work I've been trying to do involves completely rethinking what therapeutic activity looks like. And um, that's in part how I am an academic. You know, um, as Julian can attest, I didn't come to graduate school thinking I wanted to be an academic. I thought I wanted to go work in, you know, this kind of applied settings in Indian country. But it's hard to innovate in dramatic ways when you're in an applied setting um, because whoever pays your salary structures what you do with your time, really. Um, so I, I think it depends on sort of where you want to start and what you have in mind. Obviously, uh, uh, there's some stuff on my website. If you email me, I can give you some um, suggestions too. But I don't think a lot of my work, regrettably, is going to be all that helpful in terms of working with clients, although I think it is helpful in working with trainees, at least to expand um, trainee conceptions of the range of possibilities. I do think one goal for trainees is to be able to think in more sophisticated terms about cultural difference um, and about power and ideology. Um, which, uh, are, you know, are things community psychologists have been championing for 50 years. Thank you. I had a question, Dr. Gong. Wonderful. Um, this was wonderful. Thank you for sharing. This was absolutely fabulous. Um, I just had a question on that one about the, the camp. You know, you, you mentioned that they didn't see it as mental health because they were working on the, the building TPs and, and doing different things. So how important um, is it that we, we don't see mental health as, you know, not being seen as mental health? Because I think that's really important because of, of course the stigma that's associated with going to see treatment. Do you think that, I don't want to trick people, but for some cultures, I think it's, that, that stigma is such attached to going to seek treatment. How important is that we not frame it that way sometimes? Yeah, I mean, I think it needs to be keyed, of course, to your uh, population or your uh, clientele. Um, it, because, you know, I think these approaches were often um, designed uh, by and for, um, you know, upper middle class cosmopolitan types, you know, and, and, and for some of them, this is wonderful. I mean, even if you don't have a problem, you just want to grow, you might go seek therapy, you know, which is fine. That's wonderful. Um, but I think for some of our uh, people where there is stigma and so on, um, I think how we language and frame and, and make sense of can matter a lot. So one thing I call attention to is this concept of psychological mindedness. Um, what some people refer to as psychocentrism. You know, it's part of modern life that we have come to, since Freud, you know, um, which, who revolutionized the way we even imagine this stuff. Um, but, and why Freud percolates through even in this distant treatment center of native people on a reserve that's a dirt road, for, you know, that kind of stuff. Um, but um, psychological mindedness is the presumption that we are inclined and adept and oriented toward, you know, um, looking inward um, to, you know, uh, rich interiors, uh, deeply, you know, uh, in, furnished in all kinds of uh, ways that we uh, take the self as in a reflexive fashion as needing work or uh, uh, worthy of regulation and engagement um, of talking about our feelings and a verbal expression in general of, of these sorts of things. And I would submit to you that most of the world's population may not be especially psychologically minded. 
And so when therapists and therapy come to people like that, um, it's not that people can't do that. I think everyone has a facility with it, but, but it's how familiar and comfortable it is and how adept you are at it. And I think that, you know, like modern middle classes and affluent societies are, are, we live this, but I think that most people don't. And so then it becomes a question of what are the power dynamics involved in inviting people to become more adept with that. And in indigenous communities that are colonial, where people are trying to return to traditional stuff, um, where, you know, um, the self itself is not the individualist, uh, uh, neoliberal uh, pursuit of, um, you know, wealth and happiness <laughs> by navigating free markets, <laughs> you know, uh, if, if it's not that, if it really is your place is one of kinship role and obligation and relationships, not just to relatives, but to persons uh, that are not even human, uh, to land, to lands and spaces, um, you know, that's a totally different orientation. And so I think that a therapy for that would look really different than the therapy that's been designed through mental health services, which are premised on this kind of individualism. And so, you know, that's why I think it's part and parcel in thinking about that kind of traditional orientation in indigenous communities, it leads one to think about traditional therapies, which again, are religious. Um, now, other groups have religious therapeutic traditions too, you know, and so in part, it's a, a, at a meta level, it's about trying to find the kinds of approaches that are therapeutically beneficial for people that fit who they are and what they think about what matters to them. And you know, I don't need to tell you and other members here the importance of you know churches in the black community and pastoral count. I mean, and 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 actually in all communities um, in the United States, for example, Christian pastors do a lot of this work, you know, and so and they have to message it and work, use it in a way that's quite different than you know the latest great evidence-based practice. <laughs> um, and so the question is, what kind of partnerships can you and how can that be refined and and um, harnessed and what lessons can we learn and how can we do anyway? It's all a, an amazingly uh, fruitful endeavor, I think. So thank thank you for uh, such a stimulating uh, talk. You, you, you know, it seems you, you're so you're really integrating or maybe better reformulating what effective uh, intervention is in this context. Uh, and uh, I'm curious, uh, you sort of, uh, you know, sort, sort of tantalized us with, with these wonderful examples. I'm wondering to what extent have there been ripple effects from them since, since you did them? in the native communities uh, for you and uh, you know for traditional uh, in, in tr traditional Western um, practitioners at, at the uh, agencies where you worked. Yeah, I think a couple of things come to mind in response to that. One is that a lot of this is sort of proof of concept work, you know It's right. like what, what does it look like to partner? and to together come up with something that is important to people in the community itself. Um, what shape does it take and how can it be structured and facilitated and resourced in a way that will um, actually come online and actually try to work with people with, who are in need. Um, so proof of concept is probably the primary contribution from the perspective of the field. Um, in terms of people's lives who are touched, I mean, it, it does make possible, it, it, you know, it, it has a way of expanding even locally, people's uh, conceptual horizons about, hey, you know, uh, because I think in Indian country in particular, so much that happens across different communities is kind of boilerplate stuff. Someone somewhere picks up how to do a Minnesota model addiction treatment program because some people have gone to it, they want to run it themselves, so they set it up like that. There's not time to think and reflect and, and really consider all of the assumptions and orientations that come with it, and it just spreads, and people adopt it, and there can be little uh, tweaks around the edges or hiring a cultural counselor, having a group on cultural issues, but it, it takes, um, I think, um, some catalyzing work to invite people to stop and to really rethink and to engage in a process of developing something that could look very, very different. Once, mm -hmm. once it's catalyzed, I think people have no trouble going with it. And I think that they're left then with this experience of having thought way outside the box and being able and willing to think outside the box in the future. Um, I also think that another aspect of it um, uh, has to do with, you know, um, 
these issues of evaluation and resource limitation. And, you know, so I, I don't think that people have been um, all that, I've never encountered people in Indian country, I should say, who think that evaluation in a, in a systematic scientific way is all that important. The only reason that they find it useful is because they wanna get funding for programs and they know that without evaluation, <laughs> the funding is limited. So it's very pragmatic. And in Indian country, we have a way of running around that, those limitations by virtue of tribal sovereignty and domestic dependent nationhood, which means we have a direct government to government relationship with the federal um, agencies that fund stuff. And so a lot of it is just advocacy around, we want our stuff funded. We don't care about, you, you can't ask us or insist on the evaluation stuff. So um, the one, one final lesson, I guess, is that because these are tribal nations with a great deal of autonomy, there's room for innovation of this sort using federal dollars because tribes are actually often funded through with federal dollars. Even the government itself runs through federal pass through dollars and the programs they run are usually from the feds as well. And so there are sites for innovation in a way that's probably not possible in health settings around the other parts of the country um, because they have that control in a way that affords this. So again, those are some um, uh, things that came to mind in the response. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And Dr. Gorm, we have one more um, final uh, question. Okay. Susanna? Thank you very much for your presentation. I'm sorry, I cut out earlier. My internet dropped in this rural area, it happens. So um, uh, you just said a little bit about evaluation and that's really what my question was about. Um, I work in Hawaii and the native Hawaiians aren't recognized as a sovereign nation. Um, but they are an indigenous population. So um, I was wondering if you could speak a little bit about some of the experiences and decisions around whether or not and when or if ever evaluation is important and some of the, I don't know, struggles around that that might help inform our struggles as well. Yeah. You know, if we think of evaluation as, you know, even in APA, the APA task force on evidence-based practice and psychology, you know, talked about the importance of the spectrum of evidence that allows, um, you know, uh, consideration when adopting a practice that can meet client needs and expresses clinician expertise. Um, you know, and so the idea that we have to have an RCT for everything, you know, even I think the APA task force is recognizing that not only is that not possible, the shift is really to how do we evaluate the research evidence that exists to be able to make these differences. So I think it, you know, rather than worry too much, and community psychologists have done important work, I should say, on trying to develop alternatives to randomized controlled trials that can provide, you know, rigorous evidence that can help uh, assure skeptics and also, um, you know, um, assure us that the work we're doing is mattering in important ways. But um, what I want to say is that evaluation and evidence can run the entire gamut all the way to how about like, you know, with the Blackfeet Culture Camp? Well, when it was done, I interviewed people to find out what they had to say about it. You know, is that strong evidence for causal efficacy? It's not, but it's better than not even asking, right? So if we think about all the steps that you might take across this spectrum of, or what is often referred to as the hierarchy of evidence, just keeping track and inviting feedback and, you know, you could start to follow some people over time, ask them months later, a year later. There's all this stuff that one can do that just helps with in, uh, incorporating more evidence. But I think it's most useful to think of evaluation as truly answering questions that you don't know the answer to. Because I think what happens is, you know, there's almost a game that's played um, where, you know, we, it's actually, you know, we already know what we need to know. We don't even need to do an evaluation, but we need to say something to some funding agency or to people who want to know. And so, we essentially just, you know, tell them what we want to say. But that's really different than approaching evaluation as a task that answers questions that we don't have the answers to. And I think that that's worth encouraging. Like, what don't we know? And how can we get information to allow us to know it better than we do now? Those are some of the thoughts. I think that's all we have time for, folks. I wanted to say again, I'm really I'm honored and touched uh, by this award. Um, and I want to thank Julian for coming and offering that wonderful introduction. And I want to thank each of you for coming to hear what I have to share today. And I look forward to seeing you all in person at future biennials. Um, and I, I welcome you to reach out and ask any questions or anything I can do to follow up. So thank you very, very much. <laughs>